Tom. Do Pete. Hello, Hi. Pete. Oh my God, I'm back from my vacation and I just have to, I don't have a news item. I just have to tell you about my experience. Oh. Okay. I just have to tell you about I have to tell you I like it. what you're doing with your because hands. Yeah, it was amazing. So you've, I did. I think I, I was ta- talking to you as I was walking into this establishment when I was in the lovely town of Missoula. Any of our Missoula listeners, you have a lovely mm. town. Uh, oh. It was awesome, and it smelled really good. Right until I got <laughs> stranded at your truck stop, that wasn't great. Um, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about. I did. I did a float tank. Tom. That's right. You have sensory deprivation uh-huh. float tank. Yes. That's right. Yes, Why I did you did choose it. to do that in Missoula? <laughs> Is Missoula known for their tanks? <laughs> Everybody who knows anything goes to Missoula for their first float, Tom. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just no, like, pop it into not... the Miz for the whole float. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know why you do that sure. in Missoula, but I've wanted to do it for a long, long time. The last time I did anything that was sensory deprivation, anything, I was in college and they paid me 50 bucks so they could run tests on my brain while I was in a float tank. And I don't have any oh, memory wow. of it apart from here's 50 bucks. Let us tape this thing to your to your brain. And I had just seen Altered States uh, with um, oh, no. William Hurt and thought maybe yep. I'll turn into a monkey. And I was, you know, 18 and thought that'd be cool. But yeah. that, this was not like that. And since then, I have since established, I think you know this about me, I don't want to be buried alive. I have a real problem no. with water, the bottom of which I cannot see. And so right. this was a whole cavalcade of exposure yeah. therapy for me. And so, uh, but I, because I also had read that doing a float is really, really good for your anxiety. And I thought, right. okay, if I have anxiety about being buried alive, Hold my beer, anxiety float tank, <laughs> right? So I did it. I signed up for my with the, the first float program, and it was a one-hour, 60 straight consecutive minutes in one of the wow. coffin-style pods. Like, they have the right. tall ones that supposed to feel like rooms. Uh-uh, not me. I raw dog oh. it in a coffin pod. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God, why did you make it even worse? <laughs> Because I'm so proud of myself. I'm coming in with that yeah. big cough and energy. It was yeah. crazy. So tell me you know, about it. The first thing is you signed the waiver. You you signed a waiver. Do you remember what the waiver said? Uh, this isn't going to work and good luck. <laughs> and we own. Yes. I don't think we mentioned that I have done this before. Yes. I did it in Westwood Village uh, mm-hmm. and it was an experience, but I don't want to talk about my experience. I want to hear about your experience. Well, but, yeah, the waiver, but the waiver was like, you're going to be in the dark and underwater and we don't know what's mm-hmm. going on. Yeah. And we're and not secretly filming you and goodbye. <laughs> they made a real point of saying that there is a $500 charge if you right. soil the tank. Gross. That's right. And I said, I, so, I said, soil the, soil the tank. And the guy said it was late. There was nobody else there. It was a nighttime float. And he said, yeah, you know, some people like fall asleep and their bowels loosen. I said, you think I'm going to poop myself in your float tank? <laughs> and he said, Sir? I'm not saying you're going to do it. I'm just saying we have to sign the right. waiver about that. Or you might, your anxiety might lead you to throw up or something like that. I don't know. But I'm just saying it's expensive to clean these tanks because you got to filter them out. I said, OK, so I, I don't want to deal with any of that. I signed my name and pretended I didn't read it. And then he walked me through the <laughs> rules. You have to shower beforehand, take a nice yep. shower, scrub all the, the crust off of your bod. Then yeah. there were the things. You have to turn out the light because there's a light outside, like the shower light. Then you have to get in the tub, close the lid on yourself, and there is a fresh water, like a mustard bottle full of fresh water and a clean washcloth in a little basket hanging inside the float tank. Oh. And he said specifically, it, if there's anything happens and you get an itch, make sure you don't take your hand out of the salt water and rub oh. your eyes with it because right. it's uncomfortable. And I said, okay, excellent. This is outstanding. I can follow these kinds of rules. So I took my shower and then I immediately got in the float tank on my hands and knees and closed the lid on top of me and realized, oh, crap, I haven't turned off the light. So I opened it up and standing on one leg, one hand, one leg still in the coffin (laughs) tank, I reached out, turned the light, had an itch, immediately rubbed my eyes and (laughs) like it burned so bad, I fell back into the tank and splashed in 12 uh, inches of water and it flushing up all over my face. And it was horrific. It was absolutely awful. You did the awful. opposite of depriving yourself of yeah. sense. <laughs> I got all of the 
sense. <laughs> so a much sensory sense. overload tank. It was sensory <laughs> overload. And so I I immediately like I'm I the only thing I could hold on to was one, the hinge of the thing and the handle that pulls the lid down. Of course, that's not very stable because it keeps coming down as I'm holding on to it and falling. <laughs> and so I did I finally landed and uh it, it panicked. Uh, uh, great panic, but it still had this pur- the purple orb light was on. Okay. I reached over and I hit this giant, there's a big rubber button. There's two rubber buttons. One of them's for the light. One of them's for the music, which is supposed to be soft, meditative music. And I hit the, the wrong button. I hit the music button. And <laughs> I mean, the loudest music I've ever heard. This was like what? the loudest meditation jam I've ever heard. I don't know why it was so loud, but it was the loudest thing I've ever heard. And did I even mention you got to jam wax earplugs in your ears? I didn't even talk about that. I had to jam <laughs> wax earplugs in my ears. I was totally doing everything wrong. Uh, but <laughs> but I finally did it. I squished out my eyes. I rinsed cool. out my hands, did my yep. fingers in the, the washcloth, and then I relaxed and I was able to actually, like, you get, I got over the like racing heart. I'm in a small enclosed thing floating on water. I yeah. can't see below me. And it's, and I turned off the light and I turned off the music. And I'm not kidding, man. It was like the fastest 60 minutes I've ever experienced. Really? No, not the least of which because I had totally three stooged myself for the first 15 minutes but oh, it was uh, but once i once i was able to just kind of get over my own kind of inner sense of being in such an enclosed space in the dark yeah. in the water uh i don't know what happened i just lost time like it was it was really huh. really great and i walked out i told the guy after i kind of showered again and and he said i you might have fallen asleep i said i don't know about that do people do that he says all the time. When do you think people poop themselves? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't actually say that. I made that Good. part up. But that yeah. is my big celebration. I did it. I exposed myself in a wow. enclosed coffin-like thing. And uh, and I did it. It was awesome. I came out and I felt as chill as I've felt in a, a long, long, long time. So is it great. something that you think you want to do it again? Absolutely. I want a really? I want one in my I want to be podcasting from it right now. Uh I had such well, a Well, do you have a time. do you have a tub? Yeah, and I Do you have a tarp? Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm creating a crime scene, but really, let's call it sensory maybe, deprivation. Maybe, maybe some chalk. I don't yeah. know. And some, it's and weird some that the- gastrointestinal distress, and we're ready to go. Bing, bang, boom. You're a national hero. <laughs> Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Metz III. Each and every week, we drag out one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it, and hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out. Send us the story of your anxieties. Just visit the website, what's that smell.net. And uh, there's a button that says submit your anxiety. People are already doing it. And uh, episodes have only just started dropping, and we got a new one. And I'm going to talk about that today. I can't wait. Spoiler! <gasps> Oh, that's exciting. all I have to say is, uh, what's that smell? Das net. Das net. Das net. <laughs> what's that smell? Das net. <laughs> for, our, for our German <laughs> listeners. And uh, with that, uh, I don't know why it says I'll go first. I think you're supposed to go first, but maybe I I'll should go, go first. first. All right. Why don't you go first? Really? This is yeah. unprecedented. Is okay. It? it says oh. you. You should go first and then you do your uh, support spot. Good. Okay. We're going to be fine. Here we go. Uh, about how many eps of this here old fangled podcast do you think we've done at this point? Oh, like is this a test? Do I need to just? No, tell you? I think roundabouts is fine. Uh, um, what seven hundred and five? Jeez Louise, you're recording in your <laughs> sensory deprivation tank. Um, I don't know, what is that, 60, some, maybe 60, 70, yeah, somewhere in there? Something like yeah. that. Uh, how many do you think you can remember? <laughs> I can barely remember the one we're doing right now. <laughs> what did we enough. just talk about? <laughs> we have no idea. I think you were pooping in a tub. <laughs> Anyways, I ask because I'd like to jump in the Wayback Machine and touch mm-hmm. upon something we talked about way, way back on March 19, 2018. Wow. That's right. That's Pita, weird because we was were our podcasting. <laughs> that, uh, it was our second. Wait, we weren't? No, we were. I was making it. Oh. I was making a jape. 
That's right, Peter. It was our second ever episode. And is there any chance you remember what we talked about? So many questions. I, was that it? Was that yours? Where you go back and uh, and you really want to uh, do a lot of like where it was administrophobia? That was administrophobia. Was that the one? Yes. <laughs> It's ridiculous. How do you really remember that? I had to go back into our coda to figure it out. <laughs> You're exactly right. You talked about neurasthenia, which is a lot like chronic fatigue syndrome. And I touched on the six month long battle I had with an insurance carrier trying to get medical bills reimbursed for a surgery oh I had. Oh my God, that's right. And do you remember what surgery that was? Um, foot, foot, knee, here, nose, and throat. And back. All of those things, I had them all you connected. You had a rough time. <laughs> yeah. No, I had ruptured my Achilles tendon. Gross. Yeah, gross. Now, sharp-eared listeners and dedicated friends of mine will remember the valiant action I was taking when I ruptured said Achilles tendon. <laughs> you remember? I was saving children in that orphanage fire. I <laughs> do. I do. Bye, I bye. think you actually saved Flipper and Lassie. <laughs> I, I totally did. And Freed Willie. Um, Freed Willie. <laughs> I did none of those. I stepped wrong off of a sidewalk curb during a scavenger hunt. I'm single. All right. Um, <laughs> quick backstory. I was at a birthday party, and I had to run across the street to grab something, and I ran off the curb. Sidebar, real quick, a lot of sidewalk curbs in the valley. This is like I'm trying to give myself a little bit of yeah. self-esteem. A lot of sidewalk curbs in the valley are really high. They're over a foot high. That's higher than other places. I learned later this is all part of an early flood control system before storm drains were common they just had a really foot? yeah it's really high wait does That's that not really seem high, high. To you? no yeah, it's they're... really high i think i should take a like picture five inches and send it no they're higher than you think uh is everybody so, and in it's the because... valley are you all issued like we step stools just in case i think everyone just in? uses their eyes <laughs> <laughs> and you know figures it on out yeah and yeah. instead i was like <laughs> scavenger hunt anyway i stepped off the curb and all of a sudden i had this weird loping gait <laughs> like i was like bang bang because yeah. i couldn't control my foot and we all just assumed it was a sprained ankle and that is what my now very former ex-doctor also diagnosed it as saying Ooh. that i should take advil and ice it down and that my upcoming walking trip across new england for a wedding should be no problem at all just bring a cane all right. So there are a lot of things I, we're going to need to unpack yeah, in that. And yeah, we're going to yeah. have to start with who has a walking trip wedding? <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> they were on the go. <laughs> we, it was a wedding in New England, but then we were like, went to a bunch of places around it, around where the actual wedding was, taking a tour of New England, my good friend Nikki. And, and you I. decided that the best way to do that was to walk. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you're from Los Angeles right now. like <laughs> I know, but you like walk across. You don't drive through Boston, beep, beep. You walk through and you're like, there's a massacre. And we walk through Salem <laughs> and Nikki famously threw popcorn at the devil. You know, one of these yeah, uh, yeah. mannequin stores and stuff. Yeah, so I was in a ton of pain. But my doctor had said, it's just a sprained ankle, so just so you walked walk it, it off. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yep. God, that's a horrible So thing. after over a month, uh, stuff was still not working, so I got it re-diagnosed and was immediately rushed into surgery the very next day. It had wow. gotten so, this is a little gross, it had gotten so far apart, I was in danger of not being able to be operated on. Because you you're not supposed to walk around on a ruptured Achilles tendon for a month, it turns out. What? So what happens though? Wait, what happens if yeah. you, what, what is it that is happening in your ankle that makes it inoperable? The tendons are growing farther and farther and farther apart. They have split. And so these two things that are supposed to be connected yeah. are like getting farther apart. And after a while, I guess it's just sort of a wash. They get stretched too far or and something. Then what you just get, what do you, they just install like a big tendon or what? I, I no, know more, a lot I need to know. I know this is your story, but oh my God, this is so yeah, far really given me more trouble. canes. It's just more walking. More. Canes. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I have like canes strapped to my legs, yeah, strapped yeah, to my like, arms. Yeah, yeah, little canes strapped around your calves that, that yeah. are like little stilts. Yeah, I'm no, like the bad okay. guy in Avatar, only not intimidating <laughs> at all. I'm just a big pain monster. Um, so okay. I had to. I was rushed into Achilles tendon um, emergency repair the very next day, and I spent the next, I think, eight months wearing a cast and fighting a possible staph infections and la di da. It was all a lot. Wow, it was terrible and it was gross. Indeed. And, yes. Um, now, while we talked at length about the horrible bureaucracy I endured after getting healed, we didn't go deeper into a real lasting anxiety I have to this day, one that might be even more embarrassing than my chronic fear of ants. 
Pete, today I give you pizodromiophobia. <laughs> okay. What could that possibly be? It's the fear of sidewalks and sidewalk <laughs> curbs. No. Yes. Tom. Now, let me be clear. I'm not women at the windowing it. I'm not like staring out through a dark yeah. window, look, being like, there's sidewalks all around me. I'm not like <laughs> drinking a mixed drink from a can. Yeah, no, like I'm going out and stuff, but the fear does manifest in that I am acutely aware of every time I step off of a sidewalk curb yeah. and I do it a bit gingerly. Like I, I don't, I'm not like hobbling myself down. I don't want you to think that I'm never reaching a destination, but it's like, that's something that people do like blinking and breathing. You don't ever think about it. And I think about it every single time. And if it's, you know, stepping down from something is just, it's like my thing with tail strikes and planes that we talked about in the first episode. I tense up just a little bit every single time. And that's got to be anxiety, right? Yeah. Can yeah. We? Right. Um, sure. One good thing is after some heavy internet sleuthing, because fear of, I did find the word, but there's almost nothing out there. After some heavy internet sleuthing, I did learn that I'm not alone because it, phobia.fandom.com backslash wiki backslash pezrodrobiophobia. Um, the condition is defined and then under it, an anonymous poster on January 6th, 2021 wrote, I have this. And then there's a picture of a sad emoticon. So I'm not alone. Wow, there's uh, one other person? <laughs> yeah. Is that what and, you said? Yeah. And did you notice the date? I'm not sure if that's because of the <laughs> date of the posting that the user was particularly afraid of sidewalk curbs around the U.S. Cas cap capital. Yeah. Again, that was January 6, 2021. Oh God, I so, didn't even make that connection. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, so I think he's he's worried about guardrails, too. Um, yeah. So at least I'm not alone here. So here is my question. There's really not a ton to find on this. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. have sidewalk uh, uh, anxiety, usually not based off of a personal experience, but they're afraid of other people. They're afraid of being outside. They are afraid of falling over. I feel like I should know the answer to this question already, but do you have physical tics or traits that are the result of a physical or psychic trauma in your past? Or is that the entire thing of this podcast? Did I just say describe every single episode? Because yeah, all we yeah. do is have physical is or physical psychic trait? trauma. I, yeah. uh, I, uh, so, wow, I, I feel like it's it's hard to even unpack how many of these little ticks and tricks I have. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do have uh, issues with uh, uneven ground because I uh, mm -hmm. also did some some real, real damage uh, onto mm. my but with some with some uneven ground uh, and a stairs uh, going downstairs, hunt. it wasn't okay. a scavenger hunt. I the one maybe I've told this story. I was uh, I, stairs. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, liberating canned beverages from a canned beverage dispensary machine by putting <laughs> my arm up the release chute <laughs> and grabbing a Fanta oh, no. at, before my bus ride in high school. And I heard somebody open the bathroom door in the hallway behind me, and I leapt up, scraped all the skin off of my right <gasps> forearm, and then leapt off the stairs and landed on my toes on one foot and bending it with all my weight backwards uh, on oh the God. bottom stair and ripped all of the, what is it that connects muscle to bone? Uh, tendon? Tendon? Is that tendon? So I ripped them all uh, kind of off the bone on, ah, my, right. on my foot. And that has that was a real damaging kind of event for a Fanta. Uh, so yeah, I'm does it come ginger. back whenever you're drinking a Fanta? <laughs> yeah, I just collapse. Uh, yeah. I'm like one of those things, you push the, those little toys where you push the, the button on the bottom and the cowboy falls to the ground. That's kind of what I <laughs> yeah. imagine both of us are like right now. So there was that. I also am, I have real trouble around cabinet oh. doors the high cabinet doors because oh. they are like when you open your dish door and they're like right at my eyebrow oh, level and I've sure. taken, I've been clocked right in the face by a cabinet door, not because somebody opened it on me, but because it was open and I turned around and made a quick dash oh, into the kitchen you and just literally ran into walked it. into it and <laughs> no. took the corner right under my right eyebrow. So I don't love those either. So I guess I'm, I'm constantly, that's the one where in the kitchen, if somebody opens a cabinet door, even if I'm 10 feet away from it, my neck just kind of twitches back like, right like to get out of the way everybody somebody's <laughs> getting a mug yeah i um apart from sidewalk curbs i also like if i have to get on a chair to reach something high 
like I'm very mindful getting back down. Like it's mm-hmm. the idea of stepping down from something and I won't ever jump from something high, like a high wall or something like I used to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it spreads around and that's just because, you know, six to eight months. Yeah, that's of, rough. Of one God. step. It was really tough. <laughs> not worth it. So do you not go to birthday parties anymore? Certainly no scavenger hunts for you. I have done a scavenger hunt since, and I didn't injure myself once. <laughs> but I'm just because I, I never get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> I only do scavenger hunts where we're looking for canes and gone. <laughs> Uh, that has to be like on the list. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. Canes and gosh, definitely into anything that cars, causes you to meet a, uh, a like a fireman. <laughs> like you always want to meet some I sort always of emergency be, personnel. Exactly, any EMT related. Get a selfie um, with an EMT. <laughs> So there's not a lot on the internet about how to deal with this stuff other than, of course, exposure therapy. But I came up with something on my own as a mitigating factor that maybe I already used the word once. Maybe it's not that bad to be more mindful about Mm -hmm. walking around, about stepping off of things. Because as I get older, as we get older, basic mobility is just going to get harder. I mean, I have family members that are not as spry as they used to be. And falling down, the idea of falling down seems terrifying to them because... Everything is made of circus peanuts once you get older. And so maybe it's okay that I'm not just jaunting around all willy nills without thinking about it. Man, I that's good. I totally agree with that. I think I'm I'm starting to feel it, right? Starting to feel the circus peanuts part of that uh, discussion. (laughs) Like, yeah. Everything's feeling pretty fragile. Uh, well, also, especially because of your cold open and your cabinets, you're living in a fairly brothers movie. Like You are all three of the Stooges, and I don't know what to do about it. I have have no retort. (laughs) Anything else I say, I feel like is going to implicate me further. (laughs) You're pleading the fifth on the rest of your life. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Sometimes the difference between suffering and celebrating can come down to one simple thing. Teamwork. This idea is perfectly illustrated in the parable of the long spoons. It is a parable that can be traced across many cultures, including Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. The utensils and foodstuffs in the allegory vary across the world, but the overall lesson always stays the same. The first time I heard the parable, the long spoons were actually chopsticks, and here's how it went. A man visits hell and sees a large room filled with people seated around a long table. The table is piled high with steaming, delicious food of all types. Yet the people around the table are starving and miserable. And that's because they are forced to eat with extra long chopsticks. They are so long that they can't manage to reach the food into their mouths. So in agony, they sit in front of all the food they could ever want, trying in vain to feed themselves and failing. The same man visits heaven and is surprised to see an exact replica of the room, the long table, and the people with the same extra-long chopsticks. But this being heaven, these people are happy and well-nourished. What's the difference? They are using the extra-long chopsticks to feed each other instead of trying to feed themselves. So by working together, everyone is well-fed in heaven. Want a ticket to go to podcast heaven? Well, why not work together with Pete and I and become a panic pal today? By using your extra long chopsticks to type www.whatsthatsmell.net into Bing, you can click on a button and donate the one-time only low price of $35 to help keep this season in production. In addition to helping out Pete and I offset the cost of making this show, you will get early access to episodes, bonus member-only episodes, stickers, certificates, and so much more. So if you like the show, then dig in and become a panic pal today. And now, on with the show. Uh, Tom, I have Hello. to start. I have to start by talking about uh, racing, car racing specifically. Ooh, and okay, it's not because of anything specific. I don't know much about car racing, but I, uh, but I'm fascinated by this one guy, and it's getting me kind of into car racing, and that leads oh. to uh, our, the aforementioned listener submission. I would like to talk about today. Oh, that's right. I already yeah. forgot that we were doing I, that. I'm so excited. I spoiled it already. And mm-hmm. uh, so here we go. Uh, first of all, do you know what a Grand Slam is in the uh, in the space of Formula One uh, and Grand Prix racing? Only Grand Slam I know is Denny's related. Yes. Well, now you will know too, because a Grand Slam in this context is achieved by a driver 
who wins mm-hmm. a Grand Prix from the pole position, the front, leads every lap of the race, 200 laps, they're always in front, and they set the fastest lap of the race. So there are oh. those, those, it's ridiculous, right? They're way ahead out of front of everybody else the whole time. Got the it. The whole time. And they set the fastest lap of the race. I don't know how you could not set the fastest lap if you are ahead of everybody the entire time, but apparently those are two separate oh. constituent oh, yeah, elements. Those seems like those would be yeah. hand in hand. <laughs> and many, tire and tire. many drivers uh, have this in, you know, they in their entire lifetimes, their entire careers are spent with a few of these Grand Slams. But there is this guy uh, named Jim Clark, who oh. uh, is n- not only is he uh, a Grand Slam winner, he is in the history of Formula One racing. He is one of only three drivers that has achieved a consecutive Grand Slam in the same year. In 1965, he won the French Grand Prix and the German Grand Prix. And to his name in his career, he has eight Eight Grand Slams. How is that possible? He was an exceptional driver. Tom, he entered 236 races over his career. And his career was very short, uh, all things considered. He won 95 of those 236 <laughs> races. And he was on the podium in, in one, two, or three for 137 of those races. His He was 86 pole positions. And 96 of those races had the fastest laps. He was exceptional. I feel bad that I've never heard of him. That seems like that should be recognized even for someone who does not understand still what pole position means. <laughs> you said that's the first one? <laughs> yeah, when they're all in a line. I think that's where okay. you're in front. Well, okay. it, it's this is the thing about Jim Clark. He uh, he drove for Lotus, and the kinds that you you hear the kinds of things that people say about Jim Clark the the crew the crew chiefs who were working with him they they always knew what parts came from Jim Clark's cars because these cars are very fragile right oh, mm-hmm. they're they they're designed to go fast and turn a little bit but they are uh but but the parts weaken over the course of the damage that is done to them during these races and the crew chiefs and the pit pit people are saying like Jim Clark's cars always came back perfect you take pieces out of the cars it's like they'd never been driven it, he was like he was like a feather driving around this thing he he had incredible incredible skill and prowess behind the wheel wow he was an exceptional driver and then in 1968 uh, i believe is the year he um he had a, a deflating tire on his uh, the back of his car and he careened off the the you know the oh. german uh, race he was in a, a german grand prix and he, he careened off the track at 175 miles an hour broke his neck died instantly and his <sighs> car was spread over 35 yards into the Oof. woods like it was it was horrible and the sport of racing lost a great like objectively great driver yeah. and he he was he had only driven for like 14 years like he he was 32 when he when he died and he drove every class he even won the 1965 Indianapolis 500 and he was not even supposed to be a guy who could compete in the Indy 500 because he was a British F1 racer there's no reason he should be able to compete <laughs> and he won it so okay. this guy was extraordinary and I came away from this thinking, what a neat experience that this guy found uh, his thing. Like, he was a young man and said, hey, I think I'm going to try driving and ended up being exceptional at it. Like, he found his thing. This was his his one thing, right? This was his one thing. And of course, my anxiety brain doesn't look at that with any sort of joy for him. It says... Oh, God. Oh, what's mine? What if we all only have one thing? (laughs) He stumbled on his. What if I haven't found mine? And then I bring you to our listener submission. Okay. From Paul Ryan, parentheses, not that one. (laughs) I was about to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> he says, I have a career, been working for a lot of years, and in spite of some pretty good feedback on my work, I don't think I'm really good at my job. 
I hate the uncertainty that comes day after day, and I hate my brain for planting this seed of doubt that maybe I'm not good at anything. But at some level, I'd like to figure out what to do with my life that will give me satisfaction and belief that what I'm doing, that I'm doing what I need to do for myself and my family. I just don't know what that is. Tom, I give you right. oh. purpose anxiety. Purpose anxiety? Ugh. How you feel? I get it. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me what your purpose is? Have you found it? Are you doing it? Are you fulfilling your dreams and needs? I found one of the ways to make myself fall asleep at night is to just keep scaling back. <laughs> like my purpose is now, I think, just to remember to feed my dog at least <laughs> once a day. <laughs> You're making a difference. You're really making am. a difference. So all of my research leads me to understand that I shouldn't worry about this one thing philosophy. That's not, you happen to find a guy who found his and then died. So it really looked like all he had was this one thing and he was really good at <laughs> okay. it. Right. But look at Michael Jordan. I mean, you know, right? Exceptional basketball player, middling baseball player. Maybe right. his one thing, <laughs> maybe he had a thing, right. but he had a, quite a diverse career over the course of, of his careers. So, you know, there are uh, th there are things. You need to let go of certain things. So, uh, but we're in a time. Uh, just because you brought up a race car driver who was so good at his job that it killed him. And mm -hmm. then you brought up Michael Jordan, who was so good at his job that pretty famously in that pandemic released um documentary it came at the expense of his social life yeah like he was kind of a jerk and he was yeah. mean to everybody because he was so hyper competitive he just wanted to do that and so yeah there is also maybe it helps to look at the other side of that yeah at what cost purpose right 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 at what cost purpose well um the the uh purpose anxiety when you're looking at it from the purpose of this uh, larissa rainey is a uh psychology uh, psychologist researcher who said here's here's the definition roughly that we're organizing around purpose anxiety can provisionally be defined as the negative emotions experienced in direct relation to the search for purpose people who have found mm. their purpose don't have a problem with purpose <laughs> anxiety generally they don't right. think about it uh but this is for those who don't feel like you have real direction when you're feeling sort of rudderless this is the anxiety that we feel when we don't have a sense of purpose but are also aware that it's missing people who don't have a sense of purpose and don't care about it don't have the anxiety right they just they live their lives and they're doing fine right you do your right. job you it, it's fine. Uh, but the there are two different stages, apparently, that impact us here. One, we feel anxiety when we're struggling to actually uncover what our purpose is. This is Paul Ryan, not that one. Or we're attempting to enact. We've discovered what our purpose is, but we don't know how to live our purpose. We don't know what it means to actually be purposeful. We just know that there is a purpose for us. And we don't feel anxiety about not knowing what it is. We just don't know how to do it. Right. Is that right. track? It is a spectrum. Uh, it, it encompasses a range of emotions, stress, worry, frustration, fear, all of those things it can get your heart racing, can give you give you real physiological trouble that we talk about all the time. Uh, but uh, the uh, Rainey did some research on it and found that 91% of participants surveyed reported experiencing purpose anxiety at some point in their lives more, more recently than early in their lives, meaning the last decade mm. and a decade and a half has seen a real uh, a surge in use of the term purpose to define meaning in our careers, in our lives and families. That is a change over time, that you are feeling more anxiety over your purpose is relatively new in the human experience because of culture and those sorts of things. That feels right. Because I was thinking about when you were saying, you know, if you don't, if you're not worried about purpose and you're just going out and doing your job, then you're mm -hmm. fine. It seemed like we we have so much more of a yes, but does my job make me happy mentality? Yeah. Am I fulfilled yeah. versus it seemed like just before is like, I'm going to put on way too many coats mm -hmm. and I'm going to go down into this cave and breathe as much coal dust as I can and then come home and eat a loaf of bread. Yeah. And then right. because that's what you did and that's what your father did. Mm -hmm. Um and so yeah, there is there seems to be where does that come from? I want to blame uh movies and I want to blame advertising. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, uh, part of it is that. The other is the, the whole positive psychology life coaching movement that has taken root right. over the last like 20 That's years. That's true. Right? Like, right. there's a real change in the way we talk about, um, you know, building life systems and doing so that co- in a way that fulfills us, right? That, that fulfills right. what we're doing. And they suggesting that the meaning of life is found in individual life purpose. Right, that you'll have a more meaningful life. Your life will mean something, and maybe this is a shift from like finding purpose in religion, right? Finding meaning in religion, and now we're oh, finding it sure. in, uh, you know, uh, candles and you know, hummus, essential oils. I don't know, yep. essential oils. What What do you do with hummus? I don't know. I love hummus. <laughs> essential hummus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, what, and is so, that your one thing? That's Just my hummus. one thing. Is hummus. <laughs> God, I know my hummus. Uh, So in 2016, there's a large-scale global report backed by LinkedIn and uh, 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 that that showed that in some countries, over 50% of the workforce now rates, quote, purpose as important. And I would like to ask you what you think if you were to, uh, to have to gauge how baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials rate purpose of those surveyed what percentage would you say uh, baby boomers rate purpose as the most important thing in their uh it, more important than money or status what percentage would I th- of baby boomers older than uh you know 54 at this point uh would they rate purpose more important than money or status and then gen xers and then millennials well, they are the greatest generation. Um, I guess I would think because of context clues, I would think that purpose, because like going to war and stuff, that was always very important. But purpose, your own purpose versus just sort of doing the job, I would think it'd be a pretty low percentage. Okay. Uh, lower than 50%, higher than 50%, lower than 25%. Lower than 50%. Lower than fifty percent. There's still a lot of percents in there, but I'm going to leave you with that. Now, do you want me to? Do you want me to? I want you. I'd like you to zero zero in, but I'm going to ask you to zero in more for Gen Xers and Millennials. Gen Xers is that me? Am I? I, See, I also don't really know what these terms mean, even though they are widely used and widely understood. Yeah, Yeah, I. (laughs) If I'm a Gen Xer, you're a Gen Xer. I would say I would. I think it would get more and more exponentially more important as time goes on. Mm That the okay. idea of individual purpose, individual fulfillment becomes more and more and more, especially with millennials, or at least that's the press that they get. Everything that we have is about participation trophies and needing to be fulfilled, and which I always get mad at that because what they're doing is actually they're looking at old broken down systems and being like, it doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> why don't we why don't we stop kicking our own asses? Right. Does that help you at all, or do you really want numbers? Because I'm not good at this. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you the numbers from this survey, and I okay. think you will be surprised. Baby really? boomers. Forty eight percent of baby boomers rate purpose uh, as important or more important than money or status. Thirty. That's higher than I would have thought. Thirty eight percent of Gen Xers. Thirty eight percent of Gen Xers rated. It's purpose going the other as, way. It is going the other way. Guess what? Millennials. What? Thirty percent. Thirty percent of millennials. Wait surveyed, a minute. Say that purpose is as important or more important than money or status. Now there are but some complicating we just saying factors. That, yeah, we were we just saying that like the whole new movement is like headed the other direction. Yes, we are. But there are two complicating factors that go into this. Yeah. Number one, uh, it's not might not be that millennials don't prioritize purpose, and certainly when you look at surveys run by HR organizations, that's what they're hearing. That organizations with purpose tend to hire and retain people who are purpose oriented. So that's that's yep. that's one, but that millennials are in a place in their lives where they have to figure out how to eat and how to live, and therefore money might be more important than purpose right now, right? Oh, it's and a so priority thing. Now you start to look at what is the connection between money, right. resources, individual family income, individual income, and the positive psychology and life coaching movement. Right. So older people have more disposable income to invest in life coaches and positive psychology tools and a lot of hummus. 
and, and maybe less uh, responsibility so they can turn that inward now yes, and yeah. try to be like, what is my legacy going yeah. to be? What is my purpose? That makes all the sense in the world when you put it out that way. Whereas that like younger people are like, I'm just going to break my really long job stick in half so I can <laughs> possibly yeah. eat some of this stew. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to eat some of the beef. Yeah. So uh, that I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. That doesn't change the fact that there is a very real sense of loss and longing when it comes to, like, you don't feel like you mean anything in the world. And that is the right. real anxiety here, right? And that can happen to anybody. Right. I just think it's interesting to look at those statistics. So the misconceptions are, uh, you know, uh, William Damon is a psychologist who has written something about uh, some stuff about this that's pretty powerful and, and says there are two really important misconceptions. Number one is if you're feeling the anxiety you likely have internalized the feeling that purpose is fixed or attainable, that it's a goal line that you can cross. And Ooh. the truth is, right, purpose is not a goal. Purpose is not something you'll ever reach. Purpose is something you live day to day. It's just an arrow that motivates behavior and serves as an organizing principle for lives, right? It's not, right. It's not a race to finish. It's, it's who you are every day. Right. And fixating on what it, what is out there in the future doesn't actually get you any closer to purpose, right? right? Only looking right now today, every decision that you make, is it living in accordance with the purpose that you have? Uh, so that's number one. Number two, purpose is big and grandiose. This one is like written for you. Uh, Damon says, um, uh, many people hear the word purpose and they think of grand calling. Purpose sounds mm -hmm. big, ending world hunger, eliminating nuclear weapons big, but it doesn't have to be. You can also find purpose in being a good parent to your children, creating a more right. cheerful environment at the office, or yep. making a giraffe's life more pleasant. Literally, those words, giraffe's Ooh. life. And then, of course, foster, feed your dog. Like, are you making right. your dog's life better? Yeah, then there is there is purpose. So, w I like those as just framing elements to yes. what happens in purpose and uh because uh, well, to it, lower it just the means to something. lower the stakes yeah yeah really takes the pressure off because yeah. you don't have to yeah because otherwise what if you just crash into a, a building yeah. like what if you you know totally. i mean just do small things but do them purposefully and then yeah. Yeah, and just make yeah. the world a slightly better place just like that because there's plenty of other people that are doing the opposite. Yeah. We need but, people just to do slow moves of positivity all the time. Yeah, we really do. And and so there's a there's a Venn diagram that's very very popular on the internet that has four circles. I'll, I'll just describe it because podcasting is such a visual medium. Um the uh, four <laughs> circles on it and and one circle is labeled you love it, one circle is labeled the world needs it, and one circle is labeled you are paid for it, and one circle is labeled you are great at it. You love it, the world needs it, you're paid for it, and you're great at it. And all of the when those intersect, the spot in the middle uh, is your purpose, right? It's the intersection of your passion, your mission, your your vocation and your profession. That's kind of how it's so it's that's the that's the tapestry that you put on your wall mm -hmm. kind of a thing to remind you maybe to give you a target. But the best advice that I think I found in this whole thing is if you are feeling a wash of grief because you are at a loss for purpose, you probably are also at a loss of experience that the number one thing oh. you could do is broaden your experience. Go take on an apprenticeship. Go intern somewhere you've never interned. Go try a new skill. Go take up pottery or archery or singing or dancing, right? whatever. Do more things that the, the, uh, the common wisdom among the psychological community that is discovered is that if you don't know what to do with your life, it's because you aren't doing enough with your life. Interesting. Right, because you're in a rut. You're in a rut. And it manifests in a lack of purpose. But really what it is, is go do more stuff, meet more people, figure out if you're a good race driver or not, right? Figure hmm, out yeah. if you're... But you only do that. You only learn those things by actually doing. That makes a ton of sense, yes. I think so, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Just like sensory deprivation chambers. I happen to know that the fifth circle on mine is you don't poop in them. And now I know I'm okay for sensory <laughs> deprivation chambers. So I have a five circle Venn diagram. I love it. The world needs it. Oh, I wasn't paid for it. Ugh. I am great at it because I don't poop in it.
Yeah. We're going to find a way to get you paid for this, but <laughs> don't worry. I'm on the other line with LinkedIn right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say to Paul Ryan, not that one. Uh, thanks for writing. I don't know. Thank Tom, you so do you much. Have any, do you have any great advice for uh, for Paul? I that think one? I think you hit it out of the park with that, that it's just, and it can be, I like the idea of keeping it small. I like the idea of really not thinking you know, we've we've been sold a bill of goods sometimes about this do something for 10,000 hours and you're an expert. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of expectation that we put on ourselves and instead to make these small moves to do something that makes you happy and that makes someone else happy. That's purpose enough alone. I like that you brought up the 10,000 hours thing because that's that's such a, a funny fallacy. I, I don't think he's ever said you have to do something for 10,000 hours to become an expert at it. I think he's just saying on average of the people that I've surveyed and and uh, kind of researched dead and alive spent about 10,000 hours doing this thing and became experts. That's not saying that you can't become a Jim Clark and get behind the wheel and right. know how to drive a car. Right. <laughs> how many hours have we been podcasting? Because <laughs> I'm Shut I'm feeling like <laughs> shut up <laughs> is it a sign that we can only get through about 12 episodes in a season before we have to hang it up for a year <laughs> what's the opposite of jim clark we're just <laughs> driving backwards <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. This week's tune is Tell Me All the Lies by Funky Giraffe. Coming up next week. She does do a cold open, which is weird. <laughs> that takes a good 20. She does <laughs> She does do a tight two to teach you something right in the middle of your session. She does. And then there's this weird, like she keeps trying to get me to subscribe to different tiers. <laughs> I don't quite know. Do you have an answer for me? Is that what your research is going to get to the silver bullet? That's going to kill this werewolf? No. <laughs> I don't have an answer. I think Is there a, such a thing as a back alley colostomy? <laughs> like, Absolutely. <laughs> it's back behind that. Yeah, I was going to say Jiffy Lube, but that's too on the nose. Until then, I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Mess the Third. Thank you so much for downloading. We will be back next week on What's That Smell? 